Okay. Over to so, you. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, so today we have um, Pedro Pedro de la Torre. Uh, so Pedro is a PhD student. Uh, he's doing his. Uh, he, he did his master in uh, in Granada and uh, is now doing his PhD in uh, in Bari. And uh, yeah, he has visited uh, the EFT for for several months before before the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, today he will talk about. Uh, uh, cosmic ray physics uh, in connection with the uh, dark matter uh, searches. Uh, so please, Pedro. Hi, thank you, Daniele. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be doing this talk, although I, I would have preferred to be there, obviously. Well, in this talk, I will speak about the antiproton production by cosmic rays during their propagation in the galaxy and the compatibility of our predictions with any dark matter candidate. I'm gonna start, uh, I hope you see well the slides. I'm gonna start with a quick review on the propagation of cosmic rays to then go to the generation of secondary cosmic rays, namely boron, beryllium, and lithium, since they are the tools we use to better test our models. And finally, uh, I will consider antiprotons um, and we will analyze our predictions in front of the dark matter hypothesis. No? So I assume you have some notions on what cosmic rays are, those charged particles coming almost isotropically from, from the outer space. But I would like to do some emphasis in two main aspects. First, in the composition of cosmic rays. In the left, in the left side plot, you can see a comparison between the composition of dark matter nuclei with the composition of solar system matter. No? And, and you can observe that the, those primary nuclei, that is, nuclei directly forming the stars by nucleosynthesis, namely carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, neon, magnesium, the, the, the observations, the, the composition on both cases are very, very similar. While we have some big discrepancies in the left-hand side, in the lithium, beryllium, and boron group, and then in the right-hand side, in the a group below iron, scandium, titanium, vanadium. And this is not a big deal. This is something that we can predict since we expect a primary nuclei interacting with the interstellar matter forming these nuclei that are called secondary nuclei. And these spallation are called, uh, these reactions are called spallation reactions. But the problem is when, when you study this quantitatively, because the expected Amount of, amount of secondaries, even if you consider that the cosmic rays crosses, cross the, the whole uh, galactic, galactic plane, the whole galactic disk toward us, must be much smaller than the observed. And this is something we are going to explain. Let me go now to the right-hand side plot, where I'm show, showing a comparison between different cosmic ray nuclei. And I would like to emphasize here that they all share the same power law behavior, no? And this really, and what this means is that they share the same acceleration mechanism at the end. They are originated from the same source. So both the mechanism of acceleration of cosmic rays and the amount of secondary cosmic rays is something that we are gonna see now. Where, and we need to take into account the properties of the Milky Way because the Milky Way it's not, it's not just a bunch of gas joined by gravitational forces, but, is it, but it is a plasma medium embedded in a, in a magnetic field. And as you can see from the left side plot, this, the, the intensity of the magnetic field depends on the position. For, and for example, in more detailed uh, simulations as the one in the right, you can see how the direction of the magnetic field is is uh, the, the geometry of the magnetic field is difficult. And for sure, as cosmic rays are charged particles, they will interact with these magnetic fields by the Lorentz force. The electric field does not matter since uh, uh, plasma is neutral at large scale, but they will follow, they will interact with the magnetic field. In, and the, the way we see this movement, this interaction is like, in, the, in what is called the guiding center approximation. And, the, and in this approximation, uh, cosmic rays will follow the magnetic field lines doing some 
well, spiraling around the lines. So that with this, we gain more time that cosmic rays are inside the galaxy. But this is still not enough to explain the amount of secondary cosmic rays that we observe. And this is why we have to change our mind. We usually uh, imagine the interstellar medium like a very chill place, no, a calm place. But we are we also see rec magnetic reconnections like in solar flares, merging of very massive objects like neutron stars or explosions like supernova. And all these phenomena originates instabilities in the plasma medium. And these instabilities creates turbulence that propagates in the form of waves. Here I'm, I'm showing an animation of the Kevin Kelvin Helmholtz instability that is observed in normal fluids like gas, like a gas, no? And in the same way here, instability is generating a turbulence propagating away in a plasma medium, the same happens. But in this case, we have to take into account also the tension of the magnetic field lines and the magnetic pressure, such that the perturbations created by these instabilities are at the end perturbations on the original electric and magnetic fields, creating, in addition to the original magnetic field, an extra component, wave-like extra component of the magnetic field. And for sure, these waves will interact, will exchange some energy and momentum with cosmic rays since they are charged particles. And here I'm showing a, a very nice plot in which, at, in which I show three panels uh, that are three different time steps. And at the time step zero, it, an, an instability is triggered. In the upper and middle panel, I'm showing the momentum in the X and Y direction, assuming that the, the magnetic field lines are along the set direction. So the momentum perpendicular of the, of the charged particles. And in the lower panel, the perturbation of the magnetic field both in, in both perpendicular directions. So in the Y and Z direction. And as you can see, while we, uh, we proceed in time, the momentum of, of charged particles start, start to be more randomized, no? They, uh, until at the end, they, they show like a uniform uh, momentum at the end. And, what, and this leads ultimately to a randomization on the transport of cosmic rays. Here I'm showing, uh, the, in this plot I'm showing mu, which is the cosinus of the angle between the cosmic rays direction and the magnetic field lines direction that are initially uh, following the guiding center approximation. This is following the, the direction of the magnetic field lines. But then when we proceed, proceed on time, we see how this angle changes rando almost randomly. No? And at the end, this leads to a complete isotropization on the path of cosmic rays in the galaxy, making them to reside a lot of time in the galaxy and what can explain uh, the amount of secondaries that we have, that we observe. Since they reside a lot of time in the galaxy, they have mo much more in uh, probability of interact with the interstellar gas forming the secondary nuclei. But this, uh, this is usually called confinement time. This is, this is a really long confinement time, nothing to do with our confinement time due to the pandemic, no? This is of the order of mega years. And, and is, well, as I have said, the responsible of, of this amount of secondary matter that we observe. And this can also explain the mechanism of acceleration of cosmic rays via the diffusive shock acceleration mechanism, which is based uh, mainly in the Fermi mechanism, that, which is, explains that uh, an iterative acceleration in a particle makes it uh, have a power law spectrum. That is, a, a, part, a particle that is accelerated in steps, uh, iteratively in steps, will acquire a power law acceleration. And the basic idea of Fermi was that charge part was that charge particles taking energy from the movement of magnetic irregularities that it encounters iteratively may be the responsible of this power law behavior we observe. And this is, and this something like this mechanism is found around the shock front in a supernova explosion. No, 
in a, in a supernova, when it explodes, you, uh, there is two phases, the downstream and the upstream, and with the shock front expanding to the upstream. So that the, the turbulence created by the shock front while it is, it is expanded, expanded, expanding, make this cosmic, make every charged particles to have some probability to bounce back and forth uh, around this shock front. No? In the lower right uh, uh, plot, you can see for different configurations of the magnetic field around the shock front, how these particles do uh, actually can do this, this bouncing. No? They can go from downstream to, to upstream, gaining energy iteratively. And okay, this explains uh, uh, this diffusive shock acceleration explains the power law in energy that we observe, but it usually predicts uh, an spectral index not bigger than 2.3. Uh, this is the alpha value that, that you see in the left side. But the observed flux of cosmic rays has an spectral in uh, index slightly different. So to explain this, we can, we can make use of an approximation, the equation that you see in the right uh, upper part of the screen, which is simply an, an equilibrium equation where I'm equating the, the amount of particles in the galaxy in a time equal to the, to the source term, this injection, rate of injection of particles by the supernova, for example, and with a probability of cosmic rays to escape at a, at a characteristic, characteristic time, the escape time. And for us, well, and when this has reached the equilibrium, we, you, we just have the convolution between the source term and the escape time that allow us to explain the, the observed flux of cosmic rays, the spectral index, if we assume the escape time is also a power law in energy. And this is other than Observationally, observationally, also supported by the by theoretical calculations, and this can be this can be calculated uh, laboriously but easily by equating the amount of change on momentum with time with the Lorentz force, considering with the Lorentz force, considering this wave-like component of the magnetic field, that at the end uh, uh, explains a power law in this. Uh, in this escape time uh, between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 with an spectral index between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6. So both theoretically and, observ and observationally, we, we see that this escape time should be a uh, power law in energy. So, okay, we have reached the current picture of, tra of the transport of galactic cosmic rays that at the end assumes that uh, cosmic rays are diffusing inside the galaxy, understanding the galaxy as, uh, as, be, as, as being formed by a disk in which the, all the gas is inside and an extended halo uh, and, a, and a magnetized halo extended uh, up and down of the disk. And at the end, this diffusion coefficient should be also power law in energy since it is related with the escape time. So that the primary, the flux of primary cosmic rays will be just a convolution between the source term and the diffusion equation. And the secondaries will be a convolution between the, the flux of primaries, the cross section of interaction and the diffusion, such that at the end, the ratio of the flux of secondaries over primaries will just depend on the diffusion equation and on the, sorry, on the diffusion coefficient and the cross sections, this sigma. So, all right, this is the most general form of the diffusion equation. And let me uh, set the pointer to show you, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, to show you that this term, for example, describes the, the energy losses of particles while they are being transported. This is the source term, the power law that we saw at the beginning to explain the mechanism of acceleration. This, is, this describes the, the energy exchange between particles 
to cosmic ray, uh, sorry, from cosmic rays to waves and vice versa, from waves to cosmic rays. And then here we have the term that, that describes the diffusive movement with the possible inclusion of a convective movement. Finally, we have these uh, nuclear terms that describe just the, the possible decays of particles and spallation reactions. But okay, let's center on the main on the two main terms here that are the spallation term, the one in the right with the with the green uh, circle, which just depends again on the cross sections of interactions between the primary and the secondary cosmic ray, and depend for sure on the flux of primary cosmic rays. Then in the left you can see the typical parametrization, parametrization we choose for the diffusion coefficient, which has uh, which for sure is a power law in energy. In this case, this R is the rigidity, which is momentum over part charge of the particle, with the with the inclusion with the inclusion of a of a spatial term, no, that implies that they diffuse differently in different part of the cosmic uh, on the in the galaxy, in different part of the galaxy. And at the end, we know that this that this uh, diffusion equation is like this and. Uh, I mean, this it has this form. We can use this parametrization to describe the diffusion coefficient, since we know very well uh, the the secondary over primary fluxes. This comes from uh, cosmic ray experiments, and we also can can think the cross sections for experiments, for collider experiments, for example. But at this point, it's very important if we want to do a guess on the antiproton flux it's very important, this diffusion coefficient. So we have to determine it as much precise as possible, precisely as possible, no? So let me show you what is the quality in data on, cross, on, on cosmic rays. Thanks, well, in cosmic rays, the picture has changed a lot from the, uh, thanks to the AMS2 uh, experiment on board the International Space Station. Since the data it offers, has uncertainties at the level of two, three percent. So with this data, this data allow us to, to constrain very well the diffusion coefficient at a first glance, no? And the same happens for the secondary cosmic rays, beryllium, boron, and lithium. While before the situation for beryllium and lithium was very different, you can see here the, the big error bars and the scarcity of data. Now, thanks to AMS, we can use also beryllium and lithium at the same level of boron, okay? so. These are the three main secondaries that allow us to study the, the, the diffusion coefficient at the end. But the problem is that uh, the cross sections show very high uncertainties. Here I'm showing uh, an example of a reaction channel from a primary 16 oxygen to, to a secondary, which is in this case the isotope, isotope 11 boron. And this, and for sure, we have to take into account that the gas is composed by hydrogen and helium in a fraction of uh, around a 10%, no? And the point is that uh, the cross-section data that we usually have only come from the hydrogen target. I mean, we almost exclusively have uh, data of hydrogen as target. I mean, in the reactions, only hydrogen target. And they are usually very scarce and sometimes missing at high energy. And in addition, they show significant uncertainties of the order of 10% up to 50% in some channels. And what we do is to extrapolate the, the, the form of the cross sections for known channels, for example, oxygen, to those channels that we don't know very well, for example, neon, magnesium, etc. And we do the same for, for helium. I mean, we extrapolate from the hydrogen target cross-sections to the helium target cross-sections. Uh, and this is how we study it. And this is what I meant. Uh, here I'm showing a comparison between, be, well, of, be, of some channels of interaction, of cosmic ray, of co very important in cosmic ray interactions, for different parametrizations. The Weber parametrization, what the, which is the, the first one parametrization, the Galprop parametrization, that is the most widely used in the package version 5.4. And finally, uh, the cross sections that I'm 
calling here Evoli cross section, but I will call Dragon Two since they are they are going to be used in the upcoming Dragon Two code. Okay, so as you can see, for example, in the middle panels, uh, there are in some channels the, there is necessity of much more data. Sometimes we have no data about 10, T, 10 GeV. And also we observe, for example, in the channels of beryllium that, that some, da some data uh, um, show big error bars, big uncertainties. So that this means problems to, to, to really predict our fluxes of secondary particles, such that high uncertainties in, in the cross sections at the end reflect on high uncertainties in the secondary cosmic rays. But it, it is not really easy to, to assess the uncertainty that we can, we can find in, in the secondary cosmic rays, since we have to take into account all the primaries and their cross sections uh, and the cross section of interaction of every primary cosmic ray, such that at the end we have a complex cross section network, as I'm showing in the left side plot. You see here, for example, the production of uh, the isotopes of boron and beryllium that really comes from a, a really difficult network. And this has to be also done for lithium and, and so on. But thanks to the, to, to the last year's research, we know that uh, oxygen and, cam and carbon are by far the most important channels of interaction. But nevertheless, secondary channels, for example, nitrogen, neon, magnesium, are also important since they, they are responsible of around 40% of, of the flux of lithium and beryllium, while in boron, the importance of, the, of these channels is around 20, 25%. But now we also know that the tertiary channels, this is a secondary isotope colliding with gas to go to another secondary isotope, are also important at the level of a few percent. So here is where my work starts, no? And I'm showing here an, a simulation of the th these three secondary cosmic rays using the Galpro parameterization of cosmic rays. And well, I, I have used as a reference the model that fits the boron over carbon data. This is why we have such a good fit in the boron spectrum. Nevertheless, we observed that for beryllium, some discrepancies arise. And the same happened for lithium, where the more or less 20% discrepancy has led to, to a group that I'm leaving the paper here to claim the necessity of a primary component to explain the lithium access. They use, in fact, uh, the, they use the hypothesis of lithium created in novas. Nevertheless, well, the question is clear. Uh, can we make, make such claims uh, watching what is our uncertainty in the cross sections? And the problem is that we usually have to set a diffusion coefficient. Well, the problem is that uh, these uncertainties, these residuals I'm showing here, depends really on the diffusion coefficient we have chosen. And the, and the usual way we have to, to see what is the uncertainty between the different parameterizations is by setting a, a, a diffusion coefficient and then comparing the, the, the fluxes with different parameterizations. So the optimal would be to remove every necessity of setting or every dependence on a diffusion coefficient. And this is what I propose. I propose this tool, the secondary or secondary ratios, to, to be very useful in this kind of studies since they don't have any dependence or very, very small dependence on the diffusion coefficients. I'm showing, uh, well, as you can see, I'm showing uh, the secondary or secondary ratios of the AMS data for two different parameterizations, the Dragon 2 parameterization and the Galprov 1. And the only parameter, parameter that influences the, these ratios, other than the diffusion, the, other than the cross sections and the flux of primary cosmic rays, is the galactic halo, the halo size. Because beryllium has an unstable uh, isotope, beryllium 10. 
whose amount depend on the on the size of this halo of this of the halo of the galaxy but for for our discussion the halo has no other importance okay and the point here is that this dependence is is starts to be negligible about 20 30 giga electron volts okay so this make uh, give us the possibility to take the these secondary versus secondary ratios and at the at energies bigger than 10 20 GeV to evaluate to evaluate our cross sections okay so to to really test that the theory is correct and these ratios secondary or secondary ratios do, do not have any dependence on the diffusion coefficient what I have done is to to try uh, very different parameters on the on the diffusion parameterization that I presented at the beginning, and to see how they change, I have chosen lithium over the lithium over boron spectrum to show this, since there is no influence of beryllium here, and the residual while, while the plot shows uh, the the uh, the full energy range in the residual, I am I'm only showing the energy from 10 giga electron volt, so the residuals only from 10 giga electron volts, and what we see is that at 10 GeV the when changing a lot the diffusion coefficient the maximum change of, of the lithium over boron spectrum is around uh, about four g uh, about a four percent while at 30 percent the discrepancies between these different par uh, diffusion parameters goes down to three percent and i would like to emphasize here that these small discrepancies of the order of three percent uh, are due to the primary to the primary fluxes I, and with this i mean that 20 percent of the flux of carbon comes from the interactions uh, of oxygen on heavier elements with the with the uh, interstellar gas such that we have some amount of secondary carbon in the total carbon flux and the same happened for nitrogen but in in this case 50 percent of nitrogen is secondary nitrogen such that a change in the diffusion coefficient will change the flux of carbon a little bit and also of nitrogen, which explains these uh, small discrepancies. But at the end, what we see is that these cross-sections, uh, uh, these uh, ratios at high energy seem to be a very interesting tool, only depending on the flux of primary cosmic rays that we can constrain very well, thanks to the AMS data and the cross-sections such that we can study better the cross sections using these ratios. And what I'm gonna do is to draw like a, an uncertainty an uncertainty band in from the from every channel of interaction to then propagate this uncertainty to the secondary or secondary ratios. And what I'm doing is I take the mean uncertainty from the data, the measurements of of cross sections, the mean uncertainty, and I apply a renormalization to the original parameterization for every channel, up and down, such that I, de I describe two limiting cases of cross sections that must contain uh, all the cross section data. Okay, and the same is done for lithium. I'm I'm dubbing this the lithium problem because you can see the the difference in the amount of data that we have and with lithium it, it seems that this renormalization seems to be more consistent with an asymmetric renormalization and in this case it, it seems to need some extra shift upwards i mean an increase on the on the on the renormalization is required so that we will have instead of the symmetric band an asymmetric band in, for lithium and uh, okay now we have to propagate these uncertainties in the cross sections to the secondary or secondary ratios this is something that nobody has done because before the release of ams data we didn't have good good uh, secondary or secondary ratios good data on secondary or secondary ratios and it is very, very interesting to notice that the, these bands are very big, uh, meaning that these secondary or secondary ratios are very sensitive to cross-section changes. 
And in fact, what you can see is that the band, the band of uncertainty really covers all the AMS data. And I have to emphasize that this band of uncertainty only have into account the uncertainties on the main channels, on carbon and oxygen. But if we include, for example, neon, magnesium, silicon, nitrogen, these bands must, must be greater, mainly for the lithium over beryllium spectrum, okay? Such that the conclusion is that we have very big uncertainties in the determination of secondary cosmic rays, and we cannot claim so easily that we need a, a source, an extra source of primary lithium, okay? In the, in the plots here, I have also added a, a line, a simulation that, that fits well all the, all the secondary versus secondary ratios at the same time to demonstrate that with a renormalization in the different channel, in the channels, in every channel, we can simultaneously fit the secondary versus secondary ratios at the same time, which, is, well, what is something necessary if we have to study secondary cosmic rays. So my idea here is to generalize this to update our cross-section uh, cross parameterization, such that we combine the precise cosmic ray data with the not so precise, cro precise cross-section measurements. And well, the idea is simply that every Second, every model, every renormalization that fits well, secondary versus secondary ratios, and the, the cross-section measurements is a good candidate. But for me, the better candidate is the one that involves less change from the original parameterization, from the Galpro parameterization. So that to, do, to perform this, I, I, have, I have used a mass Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis in which I make the fate of the ratios at energies uh, larger than 25 giga electron volts, and uh, uh, adding a penalty factor to penalize big renormalizations. And at the end, the best candidate is that, that one that, that you see in the, well, the best candidate, the best renormalization values, the most reasonable, let's say, are those that I'm showing in the lower left. And they make sense because in the case of boron, for example, we know that our parameterization must be um, literally, little, very little affected by uh, not well-known cross-section channels. They mainly depend on carbon and oxygen that are the channels with more cross-section data. While in the case of beryllium and lithium, this is not the same. And this, at the end, makes sense because uh, it's a very small renormalization and necessary for boron, while a bigger of the order of 10% and even more in the beryllium and lithium channels. So, okay, the idea at the end is to apply this correction on the cross sections and to evaluate antiprotons under this, uh, this, uh, this model, let's say. So let me start doing a small introduction about antiprotons and how we study them to then proceed with the results. Usually, what we do is to study antiprotons as generated like secondary particles, that is, coming directly from interactions of proton with the gas, helium with the gas. And in fact, what we, what we see is that the main, uh, the main cosmic rays uh, that are involved in the production of antiprotons are helium, sorry, are helium and, and protons, while the heavier nuclei also matter at the level of a couple, a couple, well, a two percent or so at high energies, around 100 GeV. And well, I'm showing in the right part a plot that is a little bit misleading, because it generates, it uh, exaggerated a lot the differences that we found in the around the 80s from our models to the data. And for sure, these discrepancies, this uh, this underproduction of secondary antiprotons lead to a lot of ideas of primary production of antiprotons. And the main one involves the annihilation of dark matter to produce antiprotons. This is due by the annihilation of dark matter in, in a quark channel, for example, the boron antiboron, uh, sorry, boton antiboton quarks that then lead to adronization and the production of antiprotons. 
And this picture that, that I, this plot here, this picture changed it a lot. When we had uh, more data on the cross sections of antiprotons, because these cross sections, well, depend a lot on the parameters, well, the predictions depend a lot on the parameterization that you have. And in this epoch, the and now we have good uh, cross section data for these, these reactions. But we have to take into account, first of all, the anti-neutron anti decay into antiproton decay, which is roughly a factor two plus a small correction that arises from the isospin asymmetry, okay? And then we have to take into account for sure the anti, well, anti hyperons decaying into antiprotons. And these, well, and these factors, these uh, small corrections were supposed to be very, very small, but as we see from, from the plots in the right side, they are not negligible at all. They are not negligible at all. Okay, so now to show you, well, to proceed with my results, I'm gonna explain you what I do to, to produce them. First of all, I have to determine the diffusion parameters using the boron over primary cosmic ray, since as I have said, it is the best tool we have to, to test our, our diffusion coefficient. Then I will simulate the proton and helium spectra to, to that lately will produce the antiprotons, and I will propagate these antiprotons. At the end, I will do a, a, an estimation of the related uncertainties, and for sure, we will see if there is any room for a dark matter signal into our prediction of the antiprotons. So, as I have said, simply I use the I, I, well, I, I'm going to use some Markov chain Monte Carlo procedure using the boron over carbon and boron over, over oxygen and combined and combined them in the in the in the analysis to obtain the best diffusion the best diffusion parameters inside this the parameterization of the diffusion coefficient and and I'm going to do this by using the cross sections corrected with my procedure and leaving the, the parameterization of GAL prop as they are. Then I have, pro I have propagated helium, helium and protons with this diffusion coefficient. And in both cases, in the case with uh, the, the corrected cross-sections that I'm labeling here as app, app and the GAL prop, uh, and the GAL prop cross-sections. At the end, we observe that at high energies, there are almost no discrepancy with AMS data, but at, sh at low energy, we have sort of 5% discrepancies that must be corrected to avoid, well, to avoid misleading results of misleading predictions of the antiproton flux. I do this just approximately, approximately using a, a, a linear correction, okay? But this is something that is not very important since uh, it, it, it is only necessary for low energies. So here is the results. This is the prediction of antiprotons that we get using the GALPROP parameterizations. And you, may, and you should notice that the very low and very high energy part uh, show big discrepancies. But okay, let me say that this is not worrying since uh, we are sure with uh, the parameterization on the diffusion coefficient I have used is valid, is for sure correct in the range, in the range of energies from three or five GeVs to 100, 200 GeVs. So we have, we should better, we can change the, this parameterization of the diffusion coefficient as it has been made by other authors, by other authors to, to repair this. But nevertheless, where our diffusion coefficient w works well, we have a, a big discrepancy. Well, not a big discrepancy, but a significant discrepancy, which is out even for the two sigma uncertainties of the diffusion, of the diffusion coefficient. And okay, this discrepancy has been found by many authors and they have been analyzing the significance it has, uh, finding always that it is, uh, 
more significant that is significant at least at the level of three sigma. And this is even, and it predicts a dark matter candidate of around 80 GeV, more or less. And this is even more striking when considering the, that this candidate is also compatible with the galactic, uh, galactic center excess found in cosmic rays. So, well, as you can see here from this work, the residuals shown in the left, in the left plot are more or less in the same position as, as I have the, the discrepancy around 10 to 11 GeV. But this, but this picture changes a lot when I, uh, when I apply the correction to the, to the cross sections. So let me go back again to emphasize that while at high energy, the, the, the prediction has not changed too much. At low energy, it has changed a lot, which implies that uh, just a normalization in the cross section did not lead to, to uh, just a normalization on the, on the predicted, predicted spectrum of antiprotons. And, most and the most meaningful, it changes a lot the significance of this, of this feature here such that this discrepancy has disappeared. We don't have any, any, any um, discrepancy uh, favoring the dark matter hypothesis now, because all, uh, roughly all the data are in agreement even with the one sigma uncertainty bands of the diffusion. But well, the, and this and this is very important because, okay, even if my model, my correction on the cross sections is not the right one, I have demonstrated that a small correction on the cross sections lead to a different diffusion coefficient, which implies very different uh, uh, predictions of the antiproton flux. Okay, but okay, le let me check the uncertainties that we have in our model. Here I'm adding all the uncertainties that we have within one sigma within one sigma, okay, significance. And I have, to, uh, I have to say that, for example, I didn't include the uncertainties involving the, the fit of the primary protons and helium that are more important at high energies. And uh, we didn't include the, these heavy, heavier elements that can mean a push up of about 2% of our prediction. But in general, what we see is that the residuals are always at the level of 6% or so. And compared with the works of other people, uh, the, the shape of the residuals are very, very similar. You can see always the discrepancy, well, always the, the same shape, more or less. And also the, the, mani the, the management of the uncertainties is very similar to that one found by other groups. So that, well, it's very, very difficult to say, given these big uncertainties of the order of 20% and even more if we consider the full uncertainty, uncertainty bands on the cross sections, to say that we, can, we have some significance in the detection of, in the indirect detection of a dark matter signal. Well, I forgot to say, the, 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 all the uncertainties inserted here come from the solar modulation, the diffusion, the cross section, the, the cross sections, the antiproton cross section. I mean, the parameterization of antiproton cross sections. And I have added in my model sort of a 4% uncertainty to take into account what we saw that the change in the diffusion coefficient or our fit in the secondary versus secondary ratios can be slightly different. So this is a small uncertain, a next, a small extra uncertainty. So to recap a little bit, we have addressed the problems that we have in the product in the cross sections, both the cross sections important to to for secondary nuclei like lithium, beryllium, and boron, and those of antiprotons. And what we have done is that applying, well, using a combination of AMS O2 data, very precise, and cross sections measurements, we have corrected our, our uh, parameterization, cross-section parameterization, such that all the observables in which we have data from AMS have been reproduced 
is something very important. And for sure, we can improve this, this, uh, this study, adding a different form of the diffusion coefficient, for example, to, to better assess the low and high energy part. And for sure, adding heavier nuclei to take into account all the, all the production of antiprotons. And finally, the conclusion is that with a simple renormalization on the cross sections, we are able to reconcile every observable at the same time, every observable of cosmic ray data, which is something uh, dif very difficult and not usually done. Then we have demonstrated that with this correction, the prediction of the antiproton flux improves a lot. But uh, I, I have to highlight this. Even if this mm, correction that I have made is not correct and the, and, the, and the correction should be a little bit smaller or greater, we have demonstrated that a change in this cross-section that implies, for sure, a change in the diffusion coefficient it has a very big impact on the prediction of antiprotons, such that it's very difficult to do a precision test to infer the existence of dark matter, having these big uncertainties. It's very difficult. And um, well, I think I have gone a little bit fast. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, are there any any questions for for Pedro? Yes, Van, please. Yes, very interesting. Um, you were showing in relatively to the end this uh, dark matter uh, particle at 80 GV that some people had extracted from the data, but then argued that with your new corrections, mm -hmm. this uh, doesn't hold anymore. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, I would naively expect that uh, if you have such a code that makes these predictions for, for, for these curves, that the uncertainties include um, the uh, potential corrections like you have uh, calculated them now or evaluated them, yeah? Not as a fixed number, but, but as an uncertainty. And mm -hmm. if this was true, then nobody could have predicted the uh, 80 GV dark matter particle. But this means on the other hand, that simply these uncertainties are neglected. Or how, what do you, what well, can you say about this? The, the point is that the usually, these cross sections, the, I mean, the uncertainties related with these cross sections, the, let's say the spallation cross sections, are not well accounted for. This is the first point. Uh, it's very mm. difficult to estimate which are the real level of uncertainties in these cross sections. I have used the main channels to have an estimation, a rough estimation, but well, it's very difficult. Then we know, as we have seen, they are very big. So well, it's very, at the end, the uncertainty band in the in the predictive flux is very very big very really big uh, at least should be mm -hmm. a, or the order of a 20 percent more in i mean a 20 percent more uncertainty and and the point is that for example well, uh, let me go to the last slide here in this work in the left mm -hmm. uh, people only include the cross-section uncertainties in the parametrizations of the anti-proton cross-section so, but not in the spallation cross sections mm -hmm. that at the end are, are the ones that allow you to, to constrain your diffusion coefficient. So it is very important. But then one main important message is that without doing this, your results are just not reliable. Yeah. Oof. I, I would say that maybe in general, we in cosmic, doing these models of cosmic rays, we underestimate the errors, mainly coming from the cross section, with the, which is the real problem nowadays. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I have a little comment on this. Actually, yeah, there is a, a debate in the, in the cosmic ray community about the, really the necessity of uh, having more accurate measure, direct measurements of the, of the cross-sections, of all this coalition network of cross-section, precisely for, for this reason, right? Because they are, uh, as Pedro showed, uh, it is, it is very, uh, very relevant for any claim of, of dark matter. Uh, coming from this this charged particles measurements and uh, as an aside comment okay uh, this renormalization that i'm proposing is not due to let me go 
is not due to these channels that have a lot of data, but it, it, come from, it comes from those channels in which we don't have any data and we do a naive extrapolation sometimes. For example, in channels where we don't have any data, we, we only extrapolate, like for example, can be the case of silicon, for example. So these extrapolations may, be, may, be, may not be very exact because we don't have any data in those channels, so it's difficult to test it. Yeah, and if I understand, I mean, typically the people use this best fit from, from the data uh, of these uh, direct measurements of, of, uh, of cross-sections, but you propose actually to derive uh, the cross-section themselves from secondary over secondary ratios, which is very different, right, with respect to... Well, for, for sure, when we have a lot of data, when we have a lot of data uh, of cross-section measurements, they are, well, they are, uh, they have to be taken into account. But the problem is that given the, the a lot of channels that are involved in, in this uh, cross-section network, no, in this network of interactions, uh, we miss a, a lot of a lot of data at the end. We need a big effort to reconcile between the cross cosmic ray community and the cross-section nuclear people, let's say, to have more data, to have parametrization that are better. And as at the moment we don't have it, it's maybe a combination between the these ratios that are very sensitive to cross-sections can, can work well. And in fact, this prediction seems to go in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Other other questions for, for Pedro? Yeah, actually, no, I, I don't see any, any hands raised. Uh, so yeah, just, just a small uh, final question. So uh, according to your, uh, to your corrections that you apply to, to the cross section, still you are, we, are, we are left with a little anomaly at high energy, right? So this, this little hint of an excess at high energy, this seems to stay, right? Or, or, or is yeah. it correct? Yeah, this is another thing that has been seen in almost well, every study, even applying a different, a, a, a different diffusion coefficient, no? Mm. And this, can, well, the reason of this can be something proposed, well, not, not to, to, well, some years ago. And the point is that these antiprotons can be produced in acceleration sites. That is, wh when protons collide with, with interstellar gas right, right in the source, they can be accelerated. I mean, antiprotons can also be accelerated in the sources, such that we expect a, a, a hardening of the power law behavior that they have, such that it, it will go, let me put the pointer, it will go in this direction if we if we apply this model so yeah it, it, it's very possible that this hint here is a in, is an evidence uh, saying that we need to take into account the acceleration of of these secondary particles formed right in the in the source of acce of acceleration yeah Okay, okay, thanks. Still, it's not extremely significant, right, yet? I mean, I think it's... Well, it's it's two, into sigma, account, well. two sigma hints. Still, it's no, it's just a curiosity that it stays mm -hmm. there uh, with uh, any, any parameterization of the cross-section. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, this is, this is true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, for sure, at, at high energies, at these energies around 200 GeV or so, we have also more uncertainties in the, the in the proton flux, for example. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah so this can also yeah yeah this can okay, is another uncertainty that one could could plot in there. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Um, there are questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, mm, we can yeah thank the speaker again and. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.